something I wrote this morning. So bear with me. Aida <laughs> Kanori was a Japanese national who worked in Shanghai. Her mother was Chinese, and so she had grown up listening to and speaking Mandarin and didn't know it would eventually become a skill she could put on her resume. She had no friends in Shanghai. The other people who worked in the call center were all Chinese. It didn't seem to matter to them when she told them her mother was one to also. Your accent is pretty good for a foreigner. Because she was lonely, because she worked at the end of the town in a large gray office tower, perpetually shrouded in a yellow layer of smog, Ayaka took the time to notice things. She had always been observant, even as a child, even though this had often gotten her into trouble. She was sure it was a trait she had inherited from her father, an engineer. She spent eight months out of every year separated from her family. The hours at work were deadening and long. The collar was so rude it exhausted her patience at times. She wanted to transfer to the graveyard shift so she could talk to Americans, but they told her that she would have to work there six more months before they would even consider her application. You think the Chinese are rude, her shift leader, Mr. Chang, scuffed. Wait till you talk to an American. So she soon turned her attention to grooming a small bonsai on her desk, and each week devoted so much time to the plant that for a while at least it made work tolerable. Sometimes she wondered what her maternal ancestors' lives had been like before the revolution. Now that everyone was coming into the cities for jobs, she yearned to go back to the country get away from the noise and the crowds, the dense mash of cyclists that spread out like salmon, swimming upstream through the Byzantine pedestrian walkways of her adopted city. Her job, though, was easy, often not mentally taxing enough, a series of processes which even a monk could follow. Her father told her she was throwing her life away. He had always hoped she would follow in his footsteps and become a nuclear engineer, but Ayaka Though she excelled at science, grew up watching reruns of old monster films where men in rubber suits wreaked havoc on a miniature version of Tokyo. The monsters, her father told her, were nuclear aberrations, and this had frightened her. She was an apologist at work, one of the best on her shift. People called to complain about a poorly made product, the brain trust of a large American company, even though the product itself, she noticed, was always manufactured in China. And her job was to make them feel as if the company not only understood her complaint, but would move mountains to solve it. As if the company were, as it had advertised itself on TV, the customer's cool friend, one who would, by association, make each one of them somehow hipper. She was in the friendship business. That's what she told her old schoolmates back in Fukushima. Sometimes, if the customer went on too long, she put them on mute and flew a miniature Rodin across her desk, an ironic gift from her father, imagining her notepad and her half-eaten carton of noodles and a plastic bottle of Pukari sweat, all buildings the winged creature was bent upon destroying. When she tired of this, or when the customer had finally calmed down, she placed Rodin back in his roost on the main branch of the bonsai. One day, Mr. Chang saw her playing and called her into a conference room. He told her the bonsai was against company policy, that he ought to discipline her, but seeing as how it was so beautiful, he was willing to look the other way, especially if she could somehow see fit to make it worth his while. She, of course, failed to understand completely the subtext of his message, until he reached over and placed his hand on her right shoulder. Her face turned red, as if she had been drinking. She apologized, stood up, and bowed, and told her boss she would get rid of the plant immediately. However, by the time she returned to her workstation, she had already lost her nerve. She stared at the bonsai. It had been in her possession now for nearly a year, and it had already begun to twist left and right in the most interesting ways. She didn't know what to do with it. She removed Rodin, let out a mock screech in protest, and then she opened the bottom drawer of her desk and dropped the plant inside. As a school girl, Ayaka had played Tamagotchi, and she thought that caring for a bonsai was a lot like the old game and all the games she had once enjoyed in the arcades of Shinjuku. Though her parents were unnecessarily strict, 
Her sister had once purchased a Tamagotchi for her for her birthday, and she kept it like a secret underneath her pillow. Rushing home after school every night to play with it, to feed it, and to stroke it in order to keep it healthy. In this way, though she didn't know it at the time, she was once again a lot like her father, the sort of maintenance tasks he performed at the plant in Fukushima. Everything was ordered and predictable, down to an engineered science of checklists where specific items performed at specific times always netted expected results. But all of that changed after the earthquake and the tsunami. When she was younger, it seemed like her Tamagotchi was the one thing in the world that depended on her completely. Ayaka knew that if she ever stopped existing, her Tamagotchi would die. And that was enough to keep her keeping it going. That is, until she discovered boys. And then, almost overnight, she lost all interest in her virtual pet. Or was it that the battery finally died and she put a new one in? She realized with sudden horror that she would have to start all over again. And it made her heart sick. She couldn't reach her parents. She didn't know if they were dead or alive. Her sister, too. She was nearly 3,000 kilometers away from them, and there was no news, no Facebook, no Skype, no texts, no updates on Baidu. She yanked open the bottom drawer and retrieved her bonsai. She would take it home. She wondered whether her host family would allow her to keep it on the windowsill in the kitchen. It didn't need much, but her room, she knew, was too dark for it. It needed more light.